In this video, you're going to learn how to navigate the Algebra 1 final exam review. We're going to be going through together 33 different question types, in total 80 different problems. So let's get started into this video. If you want to get the most out of it, I suggest pausing the video, seeing if you can do the problem on your own, and then we'll go through it together and you can see which ones you need more help on. And I've got videos going over these concepts in greater detail on my Mario's Math Tutor and YouTube channel. So if you need help, you can go there for additional uh, resources. Let's get started into the video. The first question uh, talks about solving an equation. And this equation uh, you can see is negative three times x minus two minus five equals negative 11. So what do you think? How would you solve that problem? Well, if I was gonna solve it, what I would do is I would distribute this negative three, okay, into the parentheses, and that's gonna give us negative three x, a negative three times a negative two gives us positive six, right? Minus five equals negative 11. I always like to combine like terms first. So that's gonna be uh, six minus five, which is one, okay? And then what we wanna do is we wanna get the variables on one side, numbers on the other. So I'm gonna subtract one from both sides. So that gives us negative three X equals negative 12. And then if I divide both sides by negative three, because we just wanna get this X by itself, you can see that we get x equals four. So the question that they were really testing you on in this particular problem is, do you know the distributive property and do you know how to solve equations? So that's how you do the first one. Let's go to the second one now. It says solve five x minus two divided by 20 equals x divided by five. So what do you think? What would you do to solve that problem? Well, if I was gonna do it, what I would do is I would use the cross multiplying technique. Okay, so I would multiply on the diagonals. So five X minus two times five, right, equals 20 times X. Okay, so you're with me so far? So then what I would do is I would distribute this five into the parentheses, that's 25 X minus 10, okay, because five times negative two is negative 10. Then what you wanna do is you wanna get the variables on one side and the numbers on the opposite side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to subtract the 25x from both sides. Now, a lot of students like to get the variables on the left, but it doesn't really matter. As long as you get the numbers and the variables on opposite sides, that's the key. 20 minus 25 is negative 5x, and then we just wanna get the x by itself, so the opposite of multiplying by negative five would be to divide by negative five. So negative 10 divided by negative five is positive two. These cancel, you just get x by itself, and x equals two. Now the nice thing about algebra is that oftentimes you can check your answer by taking that value too, putting it into the original problem wherever you see x, simplifying and making sure that the left side and the right side equal each other. That way you know you've got it right. Now the question uh, or the topic that they're testing you on in this question is working with proportions. So proportion is a ratio equal to a ratio and you can use that cross multiplying technique or that cross product technique to uh, solve the equation. Okay, let's go to number three now. So number three, they're testing us on uh, you can see an absolute value equation. So how would you solve that one? Well, if I was doing it, what I would do is I would split this up into two equations. 3x minus two equals positive 10, and 3x minus two equals negative 10. Now, a lot of students, what they do mistakenly is they see the absolute value, and they say, oh, that means that I have to make everything that's negative positive. So they would make this 3x plus two. Now, you don't wanna do that. What this is really, um, asking us to do is saying whatever was in here originally could have been negative 10, right? Because then when you take the absolute value, it would become positive 10. Or whatever was in here originally before we took the absolute value could have just been a positive 10, and the absolute value just keeps it positive, right? So now that we've split it up into two separate equations, we just wanna get the variables and the numbers on opposite sides, okay? So that gives us three x equals 12, divide both sides by three, and you can see that x equals four. Over here, I'm gonna add two to both sides, so you can see that gives us three X equals negative eight, divide both sides by three, and you can see that X is equal to negative eight thirds. So you can see in this problem, we're actually getting two answers, okay? So that's the key on that one. If you need more help you know, solving absolute value equations or absolute value inequalities, again, I have more resources for you uh, on these same topics on my Mario's Math Tutoring YouTube channel. Check those out. But we're gonna go through all these different types of problems here together and then you can kind of see what you need more help on as you go through this. Now, question number four, it says find the percent of change, okay? And they tell us that the original amount is 80, the new amount is 60. Okay, so how do you think you would do that problem? Well, if I was gonna do it, I would take the new amount, 60, minus the original amount, 80, 
divided by the original amount. Okay, now remember, percent of change, this formula you wanna memorize, it's the new minus the old or the original divided by the old. Now the new minus the old, in this case you can see that's negative 20, is telling us how much it's changing by. Okay, so meaning it's going down by 20. That's what the negative represents. But then we wanna compare it to how it's changing compared to what it was originally. In this case, the 80, right? And so if we divide this out, we get uh, negative one fourth if I reduce, okay? And then if we do this on our calculator or just divide, we get negative 0.25. And then if we move that decimal two places to the right to convert it to a percentage, we're getting 25% decrease. So the negative means that it's going down. And you can kind of see that, you know, just from looking at the original problem, 80 to 60, it's decreasing. The difference here tells us by how much it's decreasing compared to the original amount or the old amount. So definitely a formula you wanna memorize if you don't know already, but that's percent of change. Again, I have more of these problems on my Mars Math Tutor YouTube channel. If you need more help, you can go and, and check those videos out. So that's uh, question number four. Let's get into the next question. Okay, question number five asks us to plot points and name the quadrant that they are in. Okay, so we've got four points here, A, B, C, and D, and we wanna plot those points and name the quadrant that they're in. So go ahead and see if you can do that. The way I would do this one is, you know, negative two, five. So negative two, that's the X coordinate. Just think alphabetical order, X, Y, Z, right? So negative two means I'm going left two, and then positive five means I'm going up five. So one, two, three, four, five. There's my point, and that's point A. Now, a quick reminder, with the quadrants, you start over here in quadrant one, and you go counterclockwise. You go this direction like so, all right? So one, two, three, and four. And I'm just using you know Roman numerals here, but you can just label them one, two, three, four. And so this one's gonna be uh, in quadrant number two, okay? Now letter B says three, negative two. So I'm going X first and Y second. So I'm gonna go right three, positive you're going to the right. And then Y is negative two, so I'm going down two. So that's our point B right there. And you can see that's in quadrant four, okay? Letter C says, uh, or point C I should say is negative four, negative one, so I'm going left four, and then down one, so that's gonna be right, right about there. That's point C, and that's in quadrant number three. And then D is five, eight, so I'm going right five, one, two, three, four, five, and then up eight, which is approximately right there, and that's point D, and that's in quadrant number one. So just a little bit of review about plotting points and knowing the names of the quadrants, okay? So number six, it says, is point negative one three a solution to the equation five x minus y equals eight so what do you think is that a solution well the way i would test this is since this is x and this is y i would put negative one in for x and three in for y and then simplify and see if the left side and the right side match if they do then that tells you that this point lies on that line and it is a solution otherwise if it's not then it's not on the line, it's not a solution. So let's see if we can put that uh, point in here, okay? Make sure you put the x in for the x, the y in for the y, don't get those uh, uh, flip-flops. So five times negative one is negative five, minus three. Uh, okay, and I'm just gonna put a question mark. Uh, remember, when you subtract, it's like adding the opposite. So negative five plus negative three is negative eight, which does not equal positive eight. So no, this one is actually not a solution. It's not a point on the line. Okay, so just substituting and checking to see if it's true or not. Okay, number seven has us graph these four lines. X equals four, Y equals negative two, X equals zero, and Y equals zero. So what do you think? How would you graph those lines? See if you can pause the video, see if you can do it on your own. But if I was gonna do this, what I would do is I'd say, hmm, X equals four. One, two, three, four, and it's a vertical line. So X equals lines are vertical lines, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, the reason is, is because no matter what y is, see if y is four, x is still four. If y is three, x is still four. No matter what y is, x is fixed at the number four. Okay, so that's how you get this vertical line. Now y equals negative two, that's gonna be actually a horizontal line like so. So no matter what the x value is, if x is one, y is negative two. If x is uh, two, y is negative two. Y is always fixed at negative two. Some students get a little bit confused by this because they see the y-axis is vertical, right? And so they think, well, hmm, if the y-axis is going like this, why wouldn't y equal negative two be going in the same direction, okay? So that's not, you know, that's not quite right. That's actually the opposite, right? So now if x equals zero now, 
Okay, x equals zero, what does that tell us? Well, that means that no matter what y is, you know, if y is negative four, x is zero. If y is zero, x is zero. If y is positive four, x is zero. So you can see y, uh, x equals zero is actually the y-axis, okay? Because any point along the y-axis, the x-coordinate is zero. And likewise, when you graph y equals zero, that's actually the x-axis, okay? Because no matter when you're on the x-axis, the y value is always going to be equal to zero. So definitely something uh, important to understand knowing how to graph these special cases of lines, x equals and y equals. So let's go to number eight now. It says find the x and y intercepts of this line. Okay, so that's saying where does it cross the x-axis and where does it cross the y-axis? So what do you think? What are the x and y intercepts for this line? Well, you could graph it, right? But what I would do here is I would just make a table. I'd make an xy table and I'd set x equal to zero to find the y-intercept. You set y equal to zero to find the x-intercept. Now when you put zero in for x, four times zero, anything times zero is zero. So I'm gonna cover that up with my hand, okay? Then if I solve this mini equation by dividing both sides by negative two, you can see that y is negative six. So that's our y-intercept right there. If we set y to zero, zero times anything is zero, so that's gonna cancel that group out. And if I divide by four, you can see x equals three. So that's gonna be our x-intercept. So that's a quick way to do it. And then if you had to graph this line, all you would have to do then at that point is say, hmm, zero, negative six, that's down here. Three, zero, that's right, three, up zero. We've got the two intercepts, x and y, we can quickly draw our line. So that's helpful when the variables are on the left and the numbers on the right. Okay, let's go to number nine now. It says find the slope, if possible, right, of the line that goes through these two points, the line that goes through these two points, the line y equals four, and then the line uh, x equals one. So what do you think the slopes are for all four of those? See if you can pause the video, see if you can do those on your own. Now, if I was gonna do it, I would pull out my slope formula. And remember that slope formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, that's how we calculate the slope when we're given two points. So in this case, this is our x1, y1, this is our x2, y2, and just remember that the two just means point number two and the one means point number one. You could make this point number one and this point number two, it doesn't really matter. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do y2 minus y1, so that's gonna be five minus negative two over negative four minus three. Now, if you have trouble working with negative numbers, which I know sometimes students do, you know, you can check out the video on my Mario's Math Theory YouTube channel about mastering negative numbers or adding and subtracting negative numbers or subtracting negative numbers. But what I do when I see a subtraction sign, I just add the opposite. Okay, so that makes it a little bit easier. So five plus two is seven, negative four plus negative three is negative seven. So we're getting a slope of negative one for letter A there. Okay, for letter B, same thing, uh, y2 minus y1, so negative four minus negative one over x2 minus x1. Again, subtracting is like adding the opposite, so I get negative three in the numerator, two minus two is zero in the denominator. Now what happens when you have zero in the denominator? It's undefined, you can't divide by zero. That's that's not possible, that's undefined. If the zero was in the numerator though, like if this was flipped, and the negative three was in the denominator, then that would just be zero. So don't get those confused. Zero in the denominator is undefined, okay? Uh, letter C, y equals four. Remember we talked about graphing lines over here. Uh, y equals four, if you look at this, it's uh, one, two, three, four. It's a horizontal line, and you can see that this has a slope of zero. It's not positive, it's not going up, it's not negative, it's not going down. It's horizontal, it's, it has a zero slope. Okay, so for this one, I'm just gonna write zero slope. And then for x equals one, that's a vertical line, like we talked about over here with the graphing. And this one actually has an undefined slope. So when it's straight up and down like that, it's like if you were trying to walk up you know, uh, a sidewalk that was vertical like that, it's right, you, you would just like free fall, right? So that's an undefined slope when it's vertical like that. So I'm just gonna write undefined, okay? Or you can use this symbol, the zero with a line through it like that, that means undefined. Okay, so you're with me so far? So that was uh, concept number nine. Okay, number 10, we've got find the slope and the y-intercept of three x minus six y equals 12. So go ahead and pause the video, see if you can figure that one out. But what I would do if I was gonna do this problem is I would try to rewrite it in the slope intercept form, okay? Which means that I wanna get this y by itself. So the way I would do that is I would work from the outside in towards that y. I would subtract three x from both sides, right? That way those cancel, we get negative six y equals a negative three x plus 12. 
I would divide everything by negative 6 because I'm trying to isolate that y right there. So y equals 1 half, see I'm just reducing x, minus 2. Now what's the slope? Remember that m, the number in front of the x there is the slope. That's the angle of your line. And the number, the constant over here, the b value, this negative 2, that's your y-intercept. So negative 2 is the y-intercept. 1 half is the slope. If you wanted to graph this, you would say, okay, the y-intercept where it crosses the y-axis is down here at negative 2. Excuse me. And then the slope is rise 1 over 2, rise 1 over 2. And you can keep repeating that process and then graph your line. So that's question number 10. And let's go on to the next question. Okay, question number 11. Uh, write an equation of the line given the point and the slope. Okay, so here's our point 6, negative 2. Here's our slope 2 thirds. How would you write an equation of the line that has this point and the slope? So go ahead and pause the video, see if you can do this. If I was going to do it, I would think of the equation of a line, like y equals mx plus b. I would substitute in the m, the slope, which is 2 thirds. Okay, and then now all we have to do is solve for b. But they give us a hint here. They tell us that y is negative 2 okay when x is 6 now 6 and a b look very similar so be careful not to confuse those the other thing to pay attention to is that sometimes students have trouble when they're multiplying a fraction times a whole number and what i recommend is just putting that whole number over one to make it into a fraction this way when you multiply you multiply the numerators together and the denominators together they line up okay so it makes it a little bit easier so that's 12 over 3 which is 4 okay so i'm just going to go over here we've got negative 2 equals 4 plus b and then I'm going to subtract 4 from both sides so you can see that b is negative 6. So if we put it all back together we get y equals 2 thirds x minus 6 since b came out to negative 6. So this question is definitely testing us on you know writing equations of lines knowing the y equals mx plus b or the slope intercept form of a line and you got it. So let's go to number 12 now. Are the lines parallel, perpendicular, or neither? Okay, so we've got two problems here. We've got uh, A and B, and how can you tell if the lines are parallel, meaning they're going up at the same rate, or they're perpendicular? So see if you can do those. Now, if I was gonna do these, what I would do is I would try to figure out what the slopes are. Because remember, if the slopes are the same, what does that mean? It means the lines are parallel, right? And if the slopes are opposite reciprocals, then that means they're perpendicular. So what do I mean when I say opposite reciprocals? Well, if one of the lines has a slope of three and the other one has a slope of negative one third, notice it's the opposite sign. One's positive, one's negative, and they're flipped. They're reciprocals. But the key is to figure out you know, what the slope is. And to find the slope, you have to put it into this y equals mx plus b form so you can isolate that, that m value. You want to get the y by itself so you can see what m is. So this one, we already know the slope is negative 2 because it's in the slope intercept form. But this one, we have to rearrange. So I'm going to subtract 10x from both sides because I'm trying to get that y by itself. OK, so with me so far. <clears throat> and then I'm going to divide everything by negative 5. And so that comes out to y equals 2x minus 8 fifths. Whoops, 8 fifths. And again, okay, you can see now the number in front of the x to the left of the x, that's 2. That's the slope. And these, okay, are not the same. So that means that they're not parallel. And they're not opposite reciprocals. They're opposite signs. See, one's positive, one's negative. But they're not reciprocals of each other. One of these would have to be 1 half, right? So these are actually in the neither category. They will cross, but they're not going to cross at a right angle. They're not going to be perpendicular. For letter B now, we can see that this one's in the slope intercept form. Okay, so y equals 3. That's our slope there. But this one we have to rearrange. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, add 2x to both sides. Okay. Divide everything by negative 6 because I'm trying to get this y by itself. And so that comes out to y equals negative 1 third x. Uh, minus 4 thirds. So here you can see the slope is negative 1 third. That's the number in front of the x. This one's 3. You can see they're opposite signs. One's positive, one's negative, and they're reciprocals of each other. One's flipped, right? So that means that these ones are perpendicular. We didn't have one that, where they were parallel, where they had the same slope, uh, but you understand the idea. So this is really testing us on the slope intercept form of the line and understanding about parallel and perpendicular. Number 13, it says graph and state the domain and range of this function right here. It's an absolute value uh, graph, okay? So what do you think for that one? How would you graph that one? Well, if I was going to do it, 
This is testing us on the transformations, knowing whether the graphs are shifting up and down, left and right, whether they're stretching, whether they're reflecting, and so forth. So what this one is doing, well actually let me start here, what this negative is doing is it's taking the, the absolute value graph, which is a V-shaped graph, the negative is reflecting it over the x-axis, it's like folding it over or flipping it over, the mirror image over the x-axis. The two is actually stretching it, okay, like this, okay, so it's going down twice as fast, and then the plus one picks up the graph and shifts it up one. So now it's gonna look like, like this. So it got a little bit messy there, so let me just go over here. It looks something like this, okay? And here's one. So that's the graph. Now for the domain, the domain is asking us, what are the x values? Well, you can see this graph is going to the left forever and ever. It's also going to the right forever and ever. So the domain, the possible x values would be all real numbers. So I'm just going to put that right under here, all reals. I drew that fancy R sign right to represent all reals. But you can write out all reals. And then the range, those are what the Y values can be. So in this case, can Y be negative 10? Sure, because this graph keeps going down and down and down. Can it be zero? Sure, you can see there's points there. Can it be one? Sure. Can it be two? No, you can see there's not any points at that level. Now what I oftentimes tell my students when I work with them you know, in person or online, as I say, take like, you know, a, a vertical line, like this marker, and scan from left to right. Now, see how it, when I scan from left to right, it's crossing the graph, see? It doesn't look like it's crossing, but it keeps going this direction, so it would cross, meaning there's uh, points on the graph at each x value, okay? And when I check for the range, I take a horizontal line, like this marker, and I scan from low to high. Okay, so domain, I go left to right. Range, I go from low to high. Now, what you can see when I get to one, and I get beyond that, there's not any points on the graph. So for this one, there's only Y values when you're at one or below. So for the range, I would say this is Y is less than or equal to one. Okay, so you're with me so far? So if you need to review graphing absolute value graphs, review the domain and the range, and then review the transformations, you know, whether you're stretching, reflecting, shifting, and so on. Okay, so let's look at number 14. It says solve and graph on the number line. And it looks like they're giving us some inequalities and they want us to graph them on the number line. So see if you can do these two. If I was gonna do them, what I would do is I would, this is a compound inequality. I would try to get that x by itself in the middle, okay? And the way I would do that is I would subtract six from the left, middle, and the right, okay? So this is gonna give us negative 14 is less than negative two x is less than four. Now you wanna get that x by itself, so then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the opposite of multiplying by negative two, I'm gonna divide by negative two. So that gives us seven is greater than x is greater than negative two. Now why greater then? Well remember, and I'm sure your teacher is gonna uh, test you on this, is that when you multiply or divide by a negative number, what happens to these inequality signs? They flip. Now if you add or subtract, it doesn't affect it, but if you multiply or divide, those inequality signs will change direction. But when you write a compound inequality, you always wanna write it in such a way that these are less than signs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this whole inequality here, I'm going to flip it, okay? So I'm going to flip it over, and now you can see x is greater than negative 2 and less than 7. So if I was going to graph that, I'll graph it down here. Uh, let's see, so here's negative 2, and here's 7. It's greater than negative 2, and it's less than 7. It has to be in between negative 2 and 7. It's like sandwiched in between those two values, not including negative 2, not including 7. That's why I drew them as open or uh, hollow like those two points there, it doesn't include that point. For letter B, this is an or variety, okay? So what we wanna do is we wanna solve them individually, get the variable by itself, okay? So here I'm gonna add nine to both sides, right? So X is greater than or equal to 17. So now if I was gonna graph this on the number line, here's eight, here's 17, X is less than eight, okay? So that means to the left or smaller or below eight and then greater than or equal to, now equal to means it includes that point, so that's solid, greater than means you're going to the right because the numbers are getting larger as it gets greater, right? So this was for letter B, you can see it's like disjoint, and then here you can see it's like in between, you know, it's sandwiched in between those two values. So if you need to review, you know, solving inequalities, compound inequalities, and so on. Let's look at number 15 now. We're working our way through the 33 different types of problems here, uh, 33 types of questions, and we're actually going through 80 problems in total, uh, actually a little bit over 80. So graph the inequalities in the xy plane. Okay, so now we're going from graphing in you know, one dimension to graphing in two dimensions. So let's look at letter A here. So when you graph this, you can see that the y-intercept is four, 
The slope is negative two, which means we're going down two, right one, down two, right one. And uh, this was supposed to be an inequality, so I'm gonna change this from equal to to less than, okay? So I'm gonna draw this as a dashed or a dotted line. And uh, less than, the way you can think about this, there's two different methods, okay? One method is when you have the y by itself, the y controls the vertical direction up and down. So if the y values are less than negative two x plus four, that means that they're gonna be below the line. I'm gonna shade straight down like this, okay? So below the line. Not left or right, but just straight, straight up or straight down since it's less than I'm shading down. The other way to approach it is to pick a test point. A lot of students will you know, pick this origin point, zero, zero, and they'll put zero in for x, zero in for y, and they'll simplify, and they get is zero, question mark, less than four. Yes, that's true, so that means where that point is, that's the true side of the, the line. If it's false, you would wanna shade on the other side of that line. And the reason I drew it as a dotted or a dashed line is because it's less than, but not equal to. So it doesn't include the points on the line, just the points below. What we have here is we found our intercepts, so when x is zero, y is negative three. When uh, y is zero, x is two. We've got a solid line. Okay, because it's equal to, so it includes the points on the line. And if we do that test point, put zero, zero, the origin in for x and y, is zero greater than or equal to six? No, that's false. So where this uh, point is, is not the true side. We want to shade on the other side. Okay, now here's where students sometimes make a mistake. They see this greater than or equal to, and they say, hmm, greater than, doesn't that mean I shade above? Well, that only works when the y value is by itself. You know, y is on, by itself on the left side here. If you rearrange this equation, like I'm gonna do right now, by subtracting three x from both sides, right? And then dividing by negative two, everything by negative two. Remember, what happens when you divide by negative, a negative number, ne divide or multiply by a negative number? This inequality sign actually changes direction, it flips. Now it makes sense, the y values are less than or equal to, you know, so we're shading below the line, see, less than below. So that's question uh, type number 15. Let's go on to the next question. Okay, cruising right along, we're at concept number 16, almost halfway through our uh, 33 different types of problems. So let's keep going. So solve the system using the substitution method. So here they're giving us two equations and they want us to solve the system using the substitution method. So see if you can do that one. If I was gonna do it, what I would recognize is that y equals three x minus seven so I'm gonna put that in place of y, that's the substitution method. You're just like a substitute teacher, that teacher shows up in place of your normal teacher, right? They're a substitute, they're a sub, right? <laughs> so basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna distribute that negative uh, into the parentheses, so that gives us negative three x plus seven, because remember the two negatives cancel, and then we've got two x minus three x is negative x plus seven equals five, subtract so seven from both sides, so we get negative x equals negative two, and if we multiply both sides by negative one, we get x equals two, and we got it. Now, the thing is, if you can put this two now back in for x, you can put it into either x. I'm gonna put it into this first one, since y is by itself. Three times two is six, minus seven is negative one. So we get two comma negative one. That's the point where these two lines would cross if you were gonna graph them. Okay, so do you understand? Now the second uh, part of this, number 17, uh, says solve the system using the elimination method. So just another way of solving systems. How do you think you would do this problem? 2x minus 3y equals negative 21, x plus 4y equals 17. Well, if I was going to do it, what I would do is I would take the second equation and I would multiply it by negative 2. And the reason I'm doing that is because if this is a negative 2x, when I add it to that top equation, the 2x and negative 2x are going to cancel each other out. So that gives us negative 2x minus 8y equals negative 34. Now notice I multiplied everything in the equation by negative two so that it's the same line. If I bring this top equation down, okay, just so that I can line everything up, when I add them together, the x's cancel, and I add the y straight down, and then I add the numbers straight down, now all I have to do is divide both sides by negative 11, and you can see that y is equal to positive five. Now if I take the five, I can put it into this equation, this equation, any one of the equations. I'm gonna do the, the second one. So that's x plus four times y, which is five, equals 17. So that's x plus 20 equals 17, and if I subtract 20 from both sides, that gives you negative three. So negative three is the x-coordinate, five is the y-coordinate, so that's the point where these two lines are gonna cross. Now if you wanna check your answer, 
which is good to do if you have time and you're taking the exam, is go ahead and put negative three in for x, five in for y, for both equations, and make sure that it makes both equations true. If it doesn't, you might have made a little mistake somewhere along the line. Okay, number 18 now says use the rules of exponents to solve, and we've got five parts here, a, b, c, d, e. So what do you think? Do you remember your rules of exponents? See if you can solve these on your own, and uh, we'll go through them. But the way I would do this is when you're multiplying, and you have the same base, see how these are both base 10? What do you do to the exponents? Well, you add them. Now some students think you're multiplying, so you multiply, but that's actually not the case. You've got three tens and four tens, that's seven tens multiplied together, which is 10 to the seventh. This next question, what you do is you multiply like terms. You say three times four is 12, x squared times x to the first. You don't see it, but it's understood to be a one there, so that gives you x to the third, and then y to the first times y to the third is y to the fourth. So just like multiplying like terms together, the numbers, the x's, and the y's. Here we're dividing. You can think of the four and 12 just like a fraction. You could reduce this to one third, but when you divide and you have the same base, you subtract the exponent. So five minus two is three, so I get x cubed over three. You don't have to put the one there because one times anything is itself. Letter D, we have a power to a power, an exponent raised to another exponent. What do we do in that case? We multiply the exponents, okay? So power to power u times. When you multiply, you add the exponents. And then here, what we have is a fraction raised to a power. What you do is you distribute that four to everything inside of the parentheses, numerator and denominator. Negative two to the fourth is actually negative two times negative two, you know, four of those multiplied together, that's 16. X to the fourth, because one times four is four. Three to the fourth is 81, because four threes all multiplied together is 81. And then two times four gives you y to the eighth. That's as far as we can go, so that's our final answer. Okay, question number 19 is referring to scientific notation and standard notation. See if you can do these problems. How would you write this in standard notation? Remember how to switch from a scientific number to a standard number? And then for part B and C, it says write it in scientific notation. We've got a really large number and we have a really small number. Now, if I was gonna do these problems, okay, see this negative eight? What the negative eight tells me to do is to move this decimal eight places to the left. If it was positive eight, I would move it eight to the right. So I'm gonna move it one place to the left, plus seven more, and I'm gonna to have to have seven uh, zeros as placeholders. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, four, six, two. So this is a really small number when you see that negative exponent, very small. This one, right now we don't see the uh, decimal point, but it's understood to be at the end of the number on the right side. We really want that decimal to be right here. Okay, because you just want one digit to the left or in front of the decimal point. So that's how many places I need to move it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's going to be 3.48 times 10 to the eighth power. Remember, it's a really large number. This is a positive exponent. This one here, I want the decimal point to end up right there. So I'm moving it one, two, three, four, five. So that's gonna be 1.82 times 10 to the negative fifth. Remember, it's a really small number. Now you can check your work. You see that negative five tells us to move it five places to the left. If we get back the original number, we know we've done it correctly. So uh, scientific notation, if you need to review that concept, you know I have more videos about that on my Mars Math Tutor YouTube channel. Okay, number 20, add, subtract, and multiply polynomials. Okay, so see if you can do these on your own. We're subtracting these two polynomials. Here you're multiplying. You've got a binomial times a binomial, another binomial times a binomial, and a binomial squared. So we've got five parts to this question. If I was gonna do it, what I would do is, when I'm subtracting, subtracting is really like adding the opposite. So I'm changing these signs to the opposite, okay? Subtraction is like adding the opposite. Now what I can do is I can go back through. I've got three x cubed. Any other three x cubes? No, so that's three x cubed. Uh, let's see, x squared, oh, I've got negative four x squared, okay? Uh, negative 2x plus negative 2x, negative 4x, positive 4 plus positive 8, positive 12. Now the main thing is you want to make sure it's going in descending order. See, 3, 2, 1, constant. So that's the standard form of a polynomial. Now this one we have a monomial, one term, times a trinomial, three terms. What I would do is I would take that 5x squared, I would distribute it to each term. So that's going to give you 5 times 3, 15x to the fourth, because remember when you multiply you add the exponents, minus 10x cubed plus 5x squared. So all it is is just distributing. You're multiplying that first term into the trinomial. 
Here we have a binomial times a binomial. You can do this two different ways. You can either use the distributive property twice. So take the negative two and distribute, take the y and distribute, combine like terms. Or some students like the FOIL method. That's an acronym for first, outside, inside, last. So the first terms would be the first and the first. That gives you three y squared. The outside are the ones towards the outside, five times y, which is five y. Inside are the ones towards the middle, that's gonna be negative six y, and last and last give us negative 10. Now remember, you wanna capture that minus sign, that's a negative two. You can combine like terms, five y and negative six y is negative y. Bring down the other terms, that's your final answer. Same thing for this one, but what's interesting about this problem is that, see how these are exactly the same, but one's minus and one's plus? Sometimes that's referred to as the sum and difference uh, type of situation, like adding and subtracting. But what happens is the negative 14x, the positive 14x, those cancel. So you just end up getting the first, which is 4x squared, and the two last terms, which is negative 49, and you got it. Okay, and then the last one, you have a binomial squared. A lot of students make the mistake of uh, distributing that two into the parentheses. That's not quite right. What you wanna think of this as is 5x minus two times another 5x minus two. See, it's squared, so that means you have two of them. So then all you can do is, is do the FOIL uh, method or the distributive property twice. So that gives you 25x squared, uh, negative 10x, another negative 10x, and a positive four. Then you just combine like terms, so that's gonna give you uh, negative 20x, and I'm just gonna bring down the 25x squared and the positive four. That's your final answer. So cruising right along, that was question number 20. Let's go on to the next question. Okay, question number 21. Factor completely, and it gives us five different problems to factor. Now, factoring is a big concept, you know, in Algebra 1 and as you go on in math. So if you're having trouble with any of these types of problems here, check out the uh, factoring videos on my Mario's Math Tutor YouTube channel. A lot of good videos there to help you. Uh, so first one, 10x squared minus 5x plus 20. Second one, 25y squared minus 16. Third one, it's a trinomial. Fourth one has four terms. And then the fifth one, is also a trinomial with a leading coefficient of five. So see if you can do these problems on your own. If I was gonna do them, the first thing you wanna do when you factor is see if you can factor out the greatest common factor. When I look at these, I can see that they're all divisible by five. So if I factor out a five or divide everything by five, what I get is two x squared minus x plus four. Now, when you see this factor completely, that means you wanna keep factoring if possible. Now. When I look at this, I can tell that this can't be factored any further, so the, that's as far as I can go with this one. For letter B, we've got 25y squared minus 16. Again, that first step is to see if you can factor out a GCF, a greatest common factor. There isn't one. I notice there's only two terms. They're both perfect squares, and they're subtracted. So what I do is I recognize that this is a difference of two squares. I take the square root of both of these quantities. Square root of 25y squared is 5y. Square root of 16 is 4 and I make one plus and one minus. Okay, so that's factoring difference of two squares. The third one here is a trinomial, and notice it has a leading coefficient of one. So this is an easy one to factor in the sense that all you have to do is ask yourself what two numbers multiply to negative 12, but they have to add to that middle coefficient negative one. And I know that that's negative four and positive three. They multiply to negative 12, but what negative four x and positive three x add to negative one x. Letter D, what jumps out at me about this one is that there's not a greatest common factor. There's nothing I can divide out of each term. But because there's four terms, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor by grouping. Okay, so I'm going to group the first two and I'm going to group the last two terms. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out the greatest common factor out of each group, you know, separately. Now what I notice is they both have a 2x plus 3 in common, so I can then factor the 2x plus 3 out of this group, which leaves us with x squared, and the 2x plus 3 out of this group, which leaves us with x squared minus 4. But again, what I notice about x squared minus 4 is that it's a difference of two squares, which means that I could factor this further to 2x plus 3, okay, that's just this term, and then x squared minus 4 is gonna be x plus 2 times x minus 2. So I ran out of room there. We'll squeeze it in right there. And the last one, we have a leading coefficient of five. It's a trinomial. You can either use the trial and error method or you can split the middle term and factor by grouping. For this problem, I'm just gonna use the uh, trial and error method and I recognize that this is gonna be negative four and positive three because the inside product, three x, and the outside product, negative 20 x, add to the middle term, negative 17 x, and three times negative four multiplies to negative 12. The first term is five x times one x is five x squared. 
This is probably the most difficult type of factoring problem when you have that leading coefficient uh, not equal to one. And again, you can check out my factoring videos to uh, learn more about how to factor these types if you're having difficulty with any of these types of factoring problems. But let's go on to number 22. Now number 22 tells us to solve these equations. This is called the zero product property because what it is is you have a product equal to zero, which means that either this first group equals zero you know, or the second group equals zero. So what you do is you make too many equations. You set 3x plus y equal to zero and 2x plus 5 equal to zero. And if you solve those equations, you're going to get x equals negative one-third and you're going to get x equals negative five-halves. Okay. This one here, though, it's not factored. So what you want to do is the first step in factoring is always to factor out the greatest common factor. And then you can set each group, each factor equal to zero. So 3x equals zero. Okay, and x minus 3 equals 0. So here if you divide by 3, x is 0. Here if you add 3 to both sides, x equals 3. Those are your two solutions. So basically just factoring, but then you take it one step further. You set each factor equal to 0. Number 23, it says graph and then identify the vertex of the axis of symmetry and the y-intercept of these two quadratics. Quadratic means that it's x squared. Okay, it's a parabola. And uh, so what we're going to do is see if you can do these on your own. But if I was going to do them, what I would do is I would recognize that my parent function is y equals x squared. That's a U-shaped graph. Okay, the vertex is right here at the origin, but then it's shifting down four. So that means it's going to look something like this. Okay, so the vertex, this point where it changes direction is zero, negative four. The axis of symmetry is this line that divides the graph in half. It goes right through the x coordinate of the vertex. That's going to be x equals zero. And then uh, the y-intercept is where it crosses the y-axis. In this case, it's negative 4. Okay. For letter B, though, it's a little bit different Okay, because it's not in this uh, basic form, this ax squared plus c form, where we're stretching it and then just shifting it up and down. Here, what we have to do to find the x-coordinate of the vertex is use this formula, which you probably remember, x equals negative b over 2a. Okay, so does that ring, ring a bell? Negative b over 2a. And so the a value is 1, the b value is negative 6, and the c value is 1. So the opposite of b, the opposite of negative 6, is going to be positive 6 over 2 times 1, which is 2. So that gives us 3 for our x coordinate of our vertex. If we put 3 back in, we get 9 minus 18 is negative 9, plus 1 is negative 8. So that means that our vertex is going to be here at 3 negative 8 right there. Our axis of symmetry is going to be x equals 3. It goes right through the x-coordinate of the vertex. And then if we set x equal to 0, you can see that y is equal to 1. That's our y-intercept. And then what we can do is we can take the mirror image over this line of symmetry. That gives us an, another easy point to locate. And then we can draw our u-shaped graph through those points. So graphing parabolas, it's a big concept in Algebra 1. Again, you can check out more videos on Mario's Math Tutoring, um, a YouTube channel, to find out more about how to graph these. Number 24 says, how does the graph relate to the parent graph, f of x equals x squared? So the parent graph is like your basic graph, but these are basically testing us on transformations. So if you remember transforming, like shifting, stretching, reflecting. So when I look at this first one, what do you think? What happens here in this graph? Well, the 4 is going to be shifting it right 4, and this is going to be shifting it down 7. Now, you want to remember the one that's grouped with the x actually has the opposite effect. So if it was plus 4, it would go left 4. Minus 4 actually goes to the right 4. This one has the same effect. It's shifting it down. So this is the vertex form uh, of a parabola. So I'll just write that down, something you might want to memorize or review. That's your vertex form. Hk is your vertex. This one here is in that basic form we were talking about over here, ax squared plus uh, c. The 6 is shifting it up 6. The 2 is stretching it. The negative is reflecting it. Now, you want to do this in order. So I, what I would do is I would say it's a vertical stretch by 2, reflects over the x-axis okay, because of this negative, and then it shifts up 6. So this graph would look something like this. And then this one here, the 1 half, see that a value, the number in front of the x squared? If it's greater than 1, it's a stretch. If it's less than 1, or I should say between 0 and 1, it's a compression, which means that the graph's going to be wider like that. So it's basically compressing it, which makes it look wider. Okay, and then 25, it says solve by completing the square. So you probably remember completing the square in your algebra class uh, if you're just reviewing this. Okay, just to refresh, see if you can do letter A and B. We've got two different problems. Okay, how do you solve this equation? How do we find out what x is uh, so that this equation is equal to 0? 
Well, what I would do if I was doing is I would get this 11, this constant on the other side of the equation. I just kind of get it out of the way, okay, so to speak. Then what you do is you take half of this coefficient in front of the x, half of 10 is five, and then five squared is 25. But if you add 25 out of thin air to the left, you have to add 25 to the right because you want to keep this equation balanced, right? Then when you factor this, this is going to be a perfect square. Now, a lot of times I lose students on this part, or students get lost, I should say, and that's because uh, they just kind of don't realize how I go from here to here so quickly. And what it is, is you just take whatever this coefficient, half of it, okay? So if this was negative 10x, this would be minus five, just half of that middle coefficient, okay? And you can verify by squaring this, by foiling it out, you'll get back the original. Okay, so that's the completing the square process, but to solve now, you just take the square root of both sides. Remember when you take the square root, you actually get two answers, plus or minus six. The square and the square root cancel. Then you subtract five from both sides, and here's also where students go a little bit off track. When you subtract five, you wanna put that in front of the plus or minus sign. So this is actually two problems in one, negative five plus six, which is one, and negative five minus six, which is negative 11. So those are your uh, two solutions to that problem. And you can always check your answer by putting it back in and seeing if it gives you zero. Okay, so you're with me so far? Again, I have videos uh, covering all these concepts on my Mars Math Tutor YouTube channel. If anything is tricky, just go to my channel, go to the search, completing the square, a lot of videos, a lot of examples, so you can learn a little bit better. But this is just meant to kind of jog your memory and uh, help you to kind of review for your final exam, right? So now on this one, you can see we have a leading coefficient of four, right? We can also see that we have our constant on the left and the right. So I'm gonna subtract the two over to the right side first, just to kind of get the, that out of the way, so to speak, okay? But because I have a leading coefficient of four in front of the x squared term, I'm gonna divide everything by four, okay? So that makes it easier to complete the square, like so. Now we take half of that coefficient in front of the x, so half of uh, negative one is uh, negative a half, negative half squared, is one fourth, but remember you want to add that one fourth to both sides to keep the equation balanced, right? And then what you do is you factor this uh, left side, which is going to be, remember, always half of this middle coefficient, so x minus one half the quantity squared, equals two and one fourth, which if you make that into a mixed number, that's nine fourths. And then that's the completing the square part, but to solve, you take the square root of both sides, which gives you plus or minus three halves, because I took the square root of the numerator and the denominator, the square and the square root cancel one another out, if I add the half to the other side, I'm running out of room, I'll put it over here. That's one half plus or minus three halves. One half plus three halves is four halves or two. One half minus three halves is negative two halves, which is negative one. And those are your two solutions, so you got it. So completing the square, definitely important. Uh, let's go on to the next question. Okay, if you're enjoying this review, Give this uh, video a thumbs up, a like, and uh, let's get into question number 26. It says, find the square roots. So we have two questions, A and B, the square roots of 25 and the square roots of 144. So when you do this problem, uh, you're basically asking yourself what number times itself is 25. So you could have positive five times positive five or negative five times negative five because two negatives will multiply together to give you a, a positive 25. Same thing with 144. You could say 12 or negative 12, sometimes written as plus or minus 12. So that's question number 26. 27, it says simplify the radicals. And we've actually got uh, quite a few different examples here, different types. So see if you can do these on your own. Okay, pause the video, see if you can work these out. And let's go through them. So square root of 48 is really like 16 times three. And the square root of 16 is four. So this is just gonna simplify to four square root of three. Square root of three is not a perfect square. So that's as far as we can go. Uh, letter B, the square root of 16 is four the square root of x squared is x, the square root of y to the fourth is y squared, the square root of z to the eighth is z to the fourth. An easy way to do these problems is when you're taking the square root, okay, see how many times two goes into these exponents. Okay, that's how I'm getting one, two, and four here. Same thing for letter c, the uh, eight is really like four times two. I just brought this two over here. Okay, so that means that the square root of four is two times this two is gonna be four, and we've got two. And then let's see, we've got one x, which is not a perfect square, that stays underneath the square root. And then y cubed, two goes into three one whole time, so I'm gonna put y there with one left over. So two goes into three one with one left over. So that's the left over one, one, that's the one that, uh, that came out. Okay, that was a perfect square, y squared times y is y cubed. 
This one here, we don't want a radical, we don't want a square root in the denominator. It's a binomial, so what we do is we multiply by the conjugate. The conjugate means that it's the same two terms, but you change the sign in between from negative to positive, or if this was positive, then this would be negative. Then all you have to do is foil the denominator, okay, and multiply the numerator. So this is gonna be five times one is five, 5 times square root of 3 is just 5 root 3. Don't make the mistake of making the square root of 15 because a 1's a number and 1's a square root. They're different terms. Here, the inside, negative root 3 and the outside, positive root 3, those cancel. We just get the first terms, which uh, 1 times 1 is 1. Negative root 3 times positive root 3 is negative square root of 9. Square root of 9 is 3, so we get negative 3. And 1 minus 3 is negative 2. So we could write this as 5 plus 5 root 3 all divided by negative 2. Okay, and then here what we're doing is we're multiplying a number and a radical times a number and a radical. We multiply the numbers together, that's 15. The square roots together, that's square root of 6. We can't divide out a perfect square there, so that's as far as we can go. Letter F, we have a square root of a fraction. I'm, what I might do on this problem is maybe reduce the fraction first. Okay, so that's square root of 10 over 4. Then I would split this up into square root of 10 over square root of 4, which is 2, and you got it. 10, you can't divide out a perfect square there, so that's as far as we can go. And then square root of 27 is really like square root of 9 times square root of 3. Square root of 9 is 3, square root of 3, plus 5 square roots of 3 equals 8 square roots of 3. Okay, so you're with me so far? So as long as these are the same, you just add the coefficients. 3 of these plus 5 of the same quantity, 8 of that quantity. Okay, so I definitely have more uh, problems like this on my YouTube channel, Mario's Math Tutoring, if you want to see more examples about how to simplify radicals. Uh, just uh, go ahead and look that up. And number 28, we're solving radical equations now. So we have a square root in an equation. We're trying to solve for x. The goal is to get that square root by itself on one side. Then what all you have to do is square both sides. The square and the square root cancel one another out. Since they're inverses, 3 squared is 9. Subtract 2 from both sides. That's 7. Now, the one downside about solving radical equations is sometimes you get extraneous solutions. What's an extraneous solution? It's like an extra or false answer. So to make sure you don't get that, what you would do is take that number, put it back in, and make sure that the left side and the right sides are equal. Make sure you put it into the original equation. So in this one, what we're going to do is we're going to isolate one of these square roots. So I'm going to get the square root of x by itself by adding that square root of x minus 7 to the other side of the equation. Then I'm going to square both sides. The square and the square root cancel, that's x. This one, because it's a binomial two terms, you actually have to FOIL it out. You actually have to write this twice, because you're squaring, that means you have two of them, and do the FOIL method. So this is actually going to come out to 1 plus square root of x minus 7, another square root of x minus 7, that's 2 square root of x minus 7s. Square root of x minus 7 times square root of x minus 7 gives you just x minus 7 equals x. Now from here what you want to do is you want to get this square root by itself on both sides, square both sides, and then simplify. But again, remember you want to take that answer and you want to put it back in the original problem and make sure that you're not getting any false answers. So maybe let me see if I can continue that down over here since I'm running out of a little bit of room here. So we've got, let's see, um, I'm going to subtract uh, 1 and negative 7 is negative 6. I'm going to add the 6 to the other side. That's x plus 6. And then over here, um, I'm going to subtract the x from both sides. So those actually cancel each other out. So like that, okay. So this really gives us 6 equals 2 square root of x minus 7. Divide both sides by 2, right? So that gives you 3 equals square root of x minus 7. Now we can square both sides. We get 9 equals x minus 7. Add the 7 to the other side. We get x equals 16. But let's check. Let's put it back in the original problem. Square root of 16 is 4. 16 minus 7 is 9. Square root of 9 is 3. Does 4 minus 3 equal 1? Yes. So that means that is the right answer. If it was wrong, then it would just be no solution in this, in this scenario. Okay, number 29, they give us this right triangle, and they say solve for that missing side, x. So what they're testing us on here is the Pythagorean theorem, right? So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Remember that c side is always the longest side. It's the hypotenuse. It's across from the right angle. So if we do that, we get 5 squared plus x squared equals 13 squared. 5 squared is 25. 13 squared is 169. Subtract 25 from both sides, we get 144. Take the square root, because we just want to get x by itself, and we get 12. So this missing side right here is going to be equal to 12. OK, now uh, let's see. Number 30, we're simplifying. So we have four different questions here. We're simplifying these uh, rational expressions. and See if you can do these on your own. 
Okay, we're going to go through them together. So we've got some multiplying, some dividing, some simplifying. Okay, but if I was going to do this first one, 8 divided by 4, I know that that's 2. When you divide, you subtract. So 3 minus 1 is going to give you a squared. And then here, two of these b's cancel with two of these b's, leaving me with b squared in the denominator. That's one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is when you divide, you subtract. So 2 minus 4 is negative 2, but the negative exponent tells us to take the reciprocal. So you move it to the other side of the fraction bar and make it positive. Okay, letter B, this one, what I would do, is if I would factor it, okay, as much as I possibly can. Okay, numerator and denominator. And then what you want to do is see if there's any factors in the numerator and denominator that cancel. Those x minus 2's cancel, so that would be your final answer. For this one, same thing, I would try to factor it as much as I can. So that's x plus 3 and x minus 3 for the x squared minus 9, difference of two squares. Uh, this one over here is 2x. This one over here is 4x squared. This one's x minus 3. Notice that the x minus 3's cancel, numerator and denominator. You can cancel them even though that they're two different fractions, as long as one's in the top, one's in the bottom. And then over here, this 2 and this 4 you can reduce. One of these x's cancels with one of these x's, leaving 1x, right? So we're left with x plus 3 in the numerator over 2x in the denominator. And then the last one here in this group is, when you divide, it's like multiplying by the reciprocal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this over, the second fraction. So you keep it, change it to multiplication, flip it. Keep it, change it, flip it. And then factor this, which is going to factor to x minus uh, let's see, I think I made a mistake on this problem, so let me change it up a little bit. Let me make this, um, let's see, how could I change this? I think I made a little bit of a mistake. So let's do this as um, positive 8. There you go. x minus 4, x minus 2. Okay. And then now, you see if anything cancels. Now, in this particular problem, nothing cancels numerator and denominator, so our final answer, we just multiply these together. But you can usually leave them in factored form, okay, on your test. Uh, like so. If this was x minus 2 and x minus 2, then you could cancel those out. So that was question number 30. Uh, let's go on to the next question. Okay, we're in the home stretch here. Just a few more concepts to cover. <clears throat> Add or subtract and simplify. So we've got a, a few different options here, A, B, C, a few different questions. So see if you can pause the video, see if you can add or subtract these uh, rational expressions. This first one, what you want to do is you want to get common denominators. So what's the common denominator between both of these? You can see it's going to be 2y squared. That's the lowest common multiple. So what I'm missing here is I have to multiply the, <clears throat> the numerator and the denominator by 2y. Okay, that way I'll get 2y squared in the denominator. <clears throat> so that's going to give us 6y over 2y squared plus 6 over 2y squared. Now what we can do is we can add these together, 6y plus 6, over the common denominator 2y squared. But what you can see is you can factor out a 6. So if I do that, I get y plus 1 over 2y squared. And the 6 and the 2 you can reduce. 2 goes into 6 3 times. So what we have for a final answer is 3 times y plus 1 all over y squared. So the key is to get the common denominators, combine them into one fraction, and then see if you can simplify further. Let's look at number uh, letter b, I should say. We want to get a common denominator, x minus 5 and x plus 5. There's really nothing in common. So we're going to take each of these two groups, make that our common denominator. This one's missing an x minus 5. So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom. I'm sorry, it's missing an x plus 5. We're going to multiply the top and bottom by x plus 5, right? This one over here is missing an x minus 5. So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by x minus 5. So then all we have to do now that we have a common denominator is distribute the 7, distribute the negative 4. See that minus 4, you can treat it like a negative 4. And uh, let's see, we're running out of a little bit of room here. So let me see if I can squeeze that in here. This is going to be 7x plus 35. This is going to give us negative 4x plus 20, which if you combine those, that comes out to 3x uh, plus 55, right? All over our common denominator of x plus 5 x minus 5. But the key is to get a common denominator so you can combine them into one fraction. Okay, letter C, what you can do is you can factor this denominator to see what it's composed of. You see we have an x plus 3 in common. This one's missing an x plus 4. That's what's keeping us from getting a common denominator. So I'm going to multiply that one by x plus 4. And you want to do that to the numerator and the denominator. So if I do that, that's going to give me 4x plus 16. 
uh, plus the 2x over here, all over our common denominator, which is x plus 4, x plus 3. Now you want to simplify and factor to see if you can uh, condense it down further. So this is 6x plus 16, all divided by x plus 4, x plus 3. I could factor out a 2, um, which would give you, let's see, 3x plus 8, but nothing's really going to cancel numerator and denominator, so I'm just going to leave that uh, as it is. Okay, and then, <clears throat> so now for number 32, uh, it's asking us to solve some equations. And the key here is when you have a fraction equal to a fraction, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the video, but you can just solve these ones by cross multiplying across the equal sign. So that's going to give you 3 times 6 is 18, x squared minus 17x. You want to get everything on one side of the equation and set it equal to 0. Then what you can do is you can factor, this is going to be x minus 18 and x plus 1, and then set the factors equal to 0. So that gives you 18 uh, and negative 1. So those are your two answers. But over here in letter B and letter C, you can see we actually have three fractions. And so a better approach for this type of problem is to clear the denominators by multiplying through by the common denominator. So what do you think for letter B and letter C? Can you do these on your own? If I was doing it, what I would do is I would find that common denominator, which is uh, 8 here. And what I would do is I'd multiply through this whole fraction, this whole um, fractional expression, this whole fractional equation by that common denominator, which is 8. So if I do that, that cancels out that denominator, giving us 3. 8 divided by 4 gives us 2, so that's minus 2x. And here, 8 divided by 2 is 4 times the 1 is 4. So now we've cleared the denominators, and it makes it a little bit easier to solve. If we subtract 3 from both sides, we get 1. If we divide both sides by negative 2, we get x equals negative 1 half. One thing you want to be careful of when you're solving these equations is that you're never dividing by 0. So if I put negative 1 half in and I made the denominator 0, then that's no solution. That's like an ext extraneous uh, solution. You want to dis discard that. For letter C, what I would do is I would factor this denominator, x plus 2, x minus 2. And then when we analyze this, we can see that the common denominator is going to be x plus 2, x minus 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply through everything by that common denominator, x plus 2, x minus 2, distribute it into the parentheses there to the left and right sides to keep the equation balanced. If we distribute it to here, see how the x minus 2's cancel? So you have x plus 2 times 1, which is just x plus 2. When you distribute it to here, the x plus 2's cancel, which just gives you x minus 2. And then when you distribute it to here, the x plus 2 and x minus 2 cancel, you just have 6. So this is going to uh, basically clear our denominators. We have 2x, 2 and negative 2 cancel, equals 6. So you can see that x equals 3, and you've got it. So that's the key, is if you can clear the denominators, it makes it easier to solve. But again, when you get that answer, you want to quickly check that the answer, to, uh, the denominator doesn't come out to 0. Like if x came out to 2 or negative 2, we would have an issue because we can't divide by 0. That would be extraneous. Here we're okay, x equals 3, so that's our solution. Okay, we're getting near the end. We've got 33, and I also have a bonus question for us, number 34. So let's see if we can get through these last couple of questions. I also want to mention that if you're studying for the ACT or the SAT math, okay, section, I have two video courses available on my uh, YouTube About page. I have the links there. It's the huge ACT math review video course and the huge SAT uh, math review video course. Very uh, comprehensive. If you like my teaching style, I go through a lot of different concepts that are covered on the test. Check that out. Uh, subscribe to the channel. You know, Check out more math videos on my Mario's Math Tutoring YouTube channel to help you in your math class, help you uh, prepare for your finals. And uh, you know, that is a definite resource there. I've got over 400 videos now on there. Just have to search my channel a little bit to find those. I have them grouped uh, in playlists, but you can also use the, uh, the magnifying glass, the search icon to locate what you're looking for. So let's go through the last two and then uh, we'll wrap this up. So hopefully it'll help you guys get a, a good grade on your, your algebra final. So here what we've got is x minus 2 is going into this expression, right? So we say, hmm, well, how many times does x go into 2x squared? That's 2x times. So I'm going to put the 2x above the 6x just to line everything up. And then I'm going to distribute the 2x to both these terms, and that gives us 2x squared minus 4x. Then we subtract, but what a lot of students like to do is change the signs to the opposite and add, because subtraction is like adding the opposite. That cancels those out. Now we're trying to see how many times x goes into negative 2x. That's negative 2 times. If I distribute the negative 2, I get negative 2x plus 4. We want to subtract or change the signs to the opposite and add, so that gives us 6. What do we do with the remainder? 
we put that remainder over what we're dividing by, the divisor, and that's our final answer. Okay, so it didn't go in evenly. We had a remainder, so we had to write our remainder over our divisor. So that's long division, polynomial long division. And in our bonus question, find the distance and the midpoint between these two points. So see if you can do that problem on your own. This is definitely important. Uh, slope, midpoint, distance, all very important formulas in Algebra 1. So if you can do that one, see if you can do that. I'm going to show you the formulas real quick here in case you've forgotten them. It's x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. You add those together and take the square root. And then the midpoint formula is like the average. You add the two x coordinates together and divide by 2. And then you add the two y coordinates together and divide by 2. It's like an average. That's how you find the middle. So let's go ahead and do this. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to say 0 minus 6, which is negative 6 squared, okay, and then negative 10 minus negative 2 is negative 8, right, squared. Add those together and take the square root. So that's 36 plus 64, which is 100. The square root of 100 is 10. So that's the distance between those two points. Now the midpoint, the halfway point between these two, we're going to add the x's together. So that's 6 plus 0 is 6 divided by 2. And we're going to add the y's together, which is going to be negative 12 divided by 2. That's 3 comma negative 6. That's our midpoint. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helps you boost your score you know, on your uh, algebra exam. Uh, if you need to review any of these concepts, like I've been saying, check out my YouTube channel, Mario's Math Tutoring. Uh, check out my video courses if you're going to be taking the ACT or the SAT. I've got uh, those two video courses available. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, like this video if it was something that was helpful to you. Comment below. Uh, all of those things. I look forward to helping you in the future videos, and I'll talk to you soon.